Welcome to Middlesex Moments, the news and information program produced by faculty and students at Middlesex Community College. I'm Steve Minkler, the Academic Dean and Lead Campus Administrator at the College, and your host for these programs. As always, Middlesex Moments comes to you from the radio and television studios found in the Center for New Media at Middlesex Community College's main campus here in Middletown. The purpose of Middlesex Moments is to give you a small glimpse into the programs and services offered by Middlesex Community College. You'll meet faculty, students, and staff, and you'll learn about the ways in which the college is connected with businesses, agencies, and schools to create a stronger community for those people that we serve. Your own health and that of your friends and family is probably pretty important to you. And if you're a pet owner, or love to ride horses, or perhaps work with farm animals, the health of our animal friends is also highly important to us. Veterinarians and veterinary technicians are an important part of the healthcare team that provides medical services to animals and supervises the use of animals in laboratory settings. With me today is Dr. Chris Gargamelli, who's the program coordinator of the Veterinary Technology Program at Middlesex Community College. And welcome, Chris. Great. Thanks for having me. I'm always excited to talk about our program here. And you've got a great program. And I know the program uh, is really a joint partnership between Middlesex Community College and Piper Veterinary located here in Middletown. And maybe explain how this works and how students learn at both the college and at Piper's. Oh, sure. So a veterinary technology program compared to some general education things like English, math, our program requires a lot of equipment, a lot of space, and patience to work on. So alone, the college could not do this program. So we needed a partner. We found a very gracious and willing partner in the Piper Veterinary Center just two miles down the road from us. And what they provide is a clinical space for our students. We actually have a surgical suite, an exam room, and a treatment area dedicated just to our students over there. Because what happens is the pace of a regular veterinary hospital that's fun fully functional is way different than a teaching pace. So for us to have our own dedicated space for the students to work with is incredible. In addition, we have a classroom over there. Classroom space is always at a premium, so that, that we have a classroom over there that we can use for our students as needed is just a great opportunity. Right, and, and students get to do all most of their clinical experience at Piper Veterinary as well, right? Exactly, and what's wonderful about that is it's always hard to find willing owners to let our students work on their patients, because our students, they are still students, and while we provide as much training as we can, you know, they still work at a slower pace and need a little bit more practice. So we have two partnerships in particular that I wanted to highlight. The first is our community dental program run out of the Piper Veterinary Hospital. So doing dental cleanings, just like a dental hygienist does, is a big role of what a veterinary technician does in veterinary practices. So to have patients to do that, the Piper Hospital has extended to their clients an opportunity for our students to work on those patients and the owner gets a discounted rate knowing that our students are going to work on them. In addition, we also have the employee program where their employees let us work on their animals so that our students can learn how to do vaccinations, basic exams, things like that. So it's a wonderful partnership. Okay. Sounds great. I understand that reporter Matt Cranes and the Middlesex Moments crew took a look at a veterinary, Piper Veterinary. Uh, let's see what they found out. At Piper Olson Memorial Hospital in Middletown, students in MXCC's Veterinary Technician Program get hands-on experience with real animals. Here at Piper Olson, I'm one of the lab instructors for the Middlesex Community College Veterinary Technician Program. Today we're working with our employee-owned pets to learn how to give injections, to clean ears, to do nail trims, to perform exams. So they're, they're getting their clinical experience from all of the stuff that they're learning in the classroom right now. Piper Olson partnered with MXCC in 2013 to create this program. As part of this joint venture, a classroom was added to the facility so that vet tech students 
can get traditional instruction and clinical training right at the hospital. I think that it gives them a great facility to, uh, to take what they learn in the classroom and uh, apply it and to get, gain experience with uh, patients, uh, with pet owners, and, um, and uh, experience real life situations. There are currently 48 students enrolled in this selective admissions program. This spring, the Vet Tech program will advance its third class of graduates. After the Veterinary Technicians program, students move directly into the workforce. We um, graduate them ready to go into the workforce. Some of them um, will choose to go into smaller private practices. Some have actually even chosen to go into more of a large animal facility and work with horses and cows and whatnot. But the goal of our program is to graduate technicians that can jump right into the workforce. Admissions to enroll in the Vet Tech program for the fall close March 29th, so hurry if you're interested. It's a really exciting partnership, Chris, and I'm really glad that students have um, the ability to learn in such a high-tech center as Piper Veterinary. Uh, after the break, when we come back, Chris and I are going to take a look at the latest high-tech teaching tool at Middlesex Community College for students in the Vet Tech program, known as Incendaver. So please stay tuned. More of Middlesex Moments will be back after this quick break. At Middlesex Community College, we think your plan A should be a high-impact, low-cost college education, preferably with no student loans required. Get started on your plan A. Welcome back to Middlesex Moments. Again, I'm Steve Minkler. My guest today, Dr. Chris Gargamelli, Program Coordinator of Middlesex Community College's Veterinary Technology Program. We're now gloved and at a table with one of the college's newest technology training tools for the Vet Tech Program, known as a Syndaver. And Chris, what is a Syndaver? So the Syndaver is a canine synthetic cadaver. It's actually made out of synthetic collagen fiber, so it's a kind of a plant-based material, but it mimics live tissue very well. So it's the closest we can get to a real dog without having a real dog. And the benefits of it are twofold to our students. The first is since our veterinary technology program is a veterinary nursing program, learning the hands-on nursing skills. So learning how to draw blood, feel the pulses, how to place IV catheters, urinary catheters, intubate the patient. These are all things that we can do in Scooby in a very lifelike manner without doing it on a live patient. So eventually our students will do all of these skills on a live patient, but they've had multiple opportunities to work with Scooby first before they bring those skills over to a live patient. All right. And you said the name of the Sendaver is Scooby? So that is the serial number mm -hmm. from the manufacturer. So rather than assigning a number when it leaves the factory, the Sendavers come with a name. And this one has the name Scooby, but coming up very soon, the Monday after spring break, we're actually going to have a naming contest to give Scooby its own middle sex name. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I would imagine Scooby can do lots of things that will help students learn before they touch a live patient. And we're gonna sh you're going to show me a few yes. of those today, right? So, so why don't we get started with so that? So for the moment, you're going to be a veterinary technology student. OK. And with Scooby, let's just do a quick rundown of what we're seeing here. So we have the head here, and we'll start here. So what we can do is we can open the mouth. So if you actually come this way a little bit, what we can do is place a breathing tube. And the way we do that is we have to get to the back of the throat. So we actually put gentle pressure on the tongue. So I'll have you put some gen gen gentle pressure on the tongue. And if you look in the back of the throat here, what you'll see is there's actually an opening. Mm -hmm. And that's where the breathing tube would go. So there's a couple more landmarks that we work with our students, but this is one of the first skills we teach is intubating the patient. So this is for anesthetic procedures, and once we do that, we can actually inflate the lungs and breathe for Scooby. Okay. So that's one of the first things. And then the next thing we're going to do is look at the forelimbs here. So as you can see, Scooby's missing skin in most areas, except for some critical areas where we practice placing IV catheters and drawing blood. So Scooby has a circulating pump that we control via a Bluetooth tablet. So I'm actually going to turn on the pump so we can feel the pulses. 
So now, it's actually easier right here on my side. So I'm going to hold up the limb, and you're going to put your thumb right over the top here. And a little bit more over kind of both sides, so you're circling. And you should start to feel the blood pulsing. Yes. And what that is, that is how one of the ways we can measure the heart rate in our patients. Mm -hmm. And this is also the location of the cephalic vein. So from here, we could draw blood along this vein and then also place an IV catheter. Okay. And what happens is, you know, it's an acquired skill. It's very tactile, learning how deep to place the catheter, how to pull back on the syringe while leaving it in the vein. Those are all very tactile skills that we can teach with Scooby. And then while we have the pump running, we're actually going to lift up the head. And just like in humans, dogs have a very big jugular vein. So here, if you put your hand along the bottom of the neck, you'll be able to feel the pulsations of the jugular vein. Yes. Yeah. And with that pulsation, that's another site that we use, especially in our smaller patients, to draw blood from. So this would be another site if you were a vet tech student from which you were to draw blood. And then I'm going to lower this, and we'll actually turn off the pump so we can hear ourselves a little bit better. And with that pump running, we can actually adjust that heart rate. We can adjust the blood pressure so that our students have multiple scenarios from which to acquire the skills in both a healthy patient and a patient that might be in shock. So it's a great tool for things along that line. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing we can use Scooby for is we can actually use it as an anatomical model. It's completely anatomically correct on the inside. So what we can do is we can actually roll Scooby over. So I'll do that. I'll bring the leg, if you hold that tube, I'll roll. Scooby, there's kind of a very set way. And what Scooby was originally designed for was to be a model in veterinary schools for surgery. So if we were running an actual veterinary medical program where the students would do surgery, they can do surgery on this abdominal plate to get inside the abdomen. So rather than do that, since our veterinary technology students don't actually do surgery, we just actually unbutton Scooby and can get a great view into the inside. And I think for the camera angle, we may actually roll Scooby one more time. So if you lift a little, we can put Scooby right on, his mm -hmm. on her back here. So she kind of just rolls like this and like this. Mm -hmm. And then we can open up and see all of the inside anatomical components. So you said this is used in uh, veterinary programs for, for students who want to be doctors of veterinary medicine. How many vet tech programs have a device like Scooby? We are one of four in the entire country. So mm -hmm. it's really amazing. Wow. So for our students, rather than just maybe getting one or two attempts on something on a live animal, can get up to a dozen attempts on Scooby before they even get to a live animal. So Amazing. it's really a lot more hands-on. So over here with Scooby, I'm going to give you a tour of the inside of a dog. So this is exactly what the insides of a real dog would look like. Mm -hmm. So you know, for those who have never seen the anatomy, this is a peak without actually having to see a live animal. So when we look up in here, we have the lungs. Mm -hmm. So earlier when we talked about placing the breathing tube, these lungs will actually inflate once we place the breathing tube in, the endotracheal tube. We have the heart. And then these things are separated by the diaphragm. This separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And then this is really where things get interesting. It's a fully functional abdomen. So just like in humans, dogs have a liver. So this is this structure right here. And you can put your hands on it, feel it, move it around a little bit. So there's multiple lobes to the liver. And then just like in humans, the dogs do have a gallbladder. Mm -hmm. So as in some humans, the gallbladder can cause some dogs an issue. And you can actually do surgery to remove that. And that's one of the surgeries that could be performed on Scooby if we were practicing for veterinary school. As we and this ahead. is meant to simulate the actual the feel of the actual organs? It is too? very close. Wow. The first time I ever felt it, you know, having you know, done a lot of abdominal surgery, the first time I felt it, I was amazed at how realistic it felt. Wow. So we work our way liver and then gallbladder. And then Scooby does have a stomach right here. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, if you want to lift it up for a second. And the interesting thing about the stomach, does it feel empty or full to you? It feels full to me. So, you know, one of the things that happens in veterinary medicine is dogs eat all kinds of things. They eat socks, they eat toys. So we have to get used to what that looks like on an x-ray. Mm -hmm. And we have to get used to, on the veterinary side at least, doing surgery on it. So this is set up so that you can remove foreign objects from okay. Scooby. And as we work our way back, we go from the stomach. 
and then it goes to the small intestine. Mm -hmm. And along that sits the pancreas. So both humans and animals have a pancreas, and it produces the key digestive juices for the body, and it also produces insulin. And the small intestines are actually incredibly long. We can actually move them out of Scooby and show you quite how long they would be. Wow. So they go around and around. And the beauty of Scooby is it mimics both normal and abnormal. So you can see here, as you're going along, does this piece of intestine look as healthy as everything else? Well, it looks different right. to me. Different <laughs> I assume is it's not, not as healthy. Exactly. So yeah. the darker red it is, that's signs of bruising and a problem. Mm -hmm. And what happens with Scooby is they actually set it up to show a little rubber ball going through the intestine and getting lodged in various places. So that's what's going on here. So we work our way through, and then we have the junction of the small and the large intestine. This little structure here is called the cecum. We work our way around, and then the colon works its way out the back end of Scooby. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the nice thing here is actually while I'm here and have everything pulled out, so Scooby is designed to be a female dog. So they have the uterus here and then the ovaries. So just like in a real female dog, we have complete anatomical correctness. Okay. One other structure that kind of flopped a little is the spleen. We call the spleen the oil filter of the body. So as the blood circulates through the body, it all filters through the spleen. And then back here, if you, the plate moves up a little bit, right here, we have the urinary bladder. And this structure, so one of the things that happens in veterinary medicine is we have to put a catheter in our patients sometimes to get a urine sample if they're having trouble urinating. And Scooby is anatomically correct enough that our students learn how to place a urinary catheter. So it's really quite amazing all the structures and how anatomically correct that Scooby is. Absolutely. So what has the student's response been to using Scooby before then going to the clinicals at, at Piper? So it's funny, as we work with the students over the years, what we see is they get very nervous the first time they work on a live patient. With Scooby, this is the first year that I've seen a lot less nervousness with them, that they're much more confident when they go to that live patient for the first time. Okay, that's fantastic. Okay, well, thanks for giving me a little tour of Scooby, our Sindaver. And uh, this piece of equipment also, incidentally, was helped funded by a Perkins Federal Career and Technical Education grant that the college had in order to bring this to the college and also help train some of our high school partners who have veterinary technology programs. When we come back from the break, our ever-popular Ask, uh, Ve Ask the Veterinarian segment where we're going to have questions from our viewers for Dr. Chris Gargamelli. Stay tuned. Honey, where's my brown coat? Check the back closet. Ah! Why do we have these old computers in the closet? Well, I can't put them in the trash. It's bad for the environment. I just don't know what to do with them. Good news. Connecticut residents can now recycle their unwanted computers, monitors, printers, TVs, and it's free. Contact your town for drop-off locations or go to www.ct.gov slash recycle. Welcome back to Middlesex Moments coming to you from Middlesex Community College. Today's program we've been focusing on our veterinary technology program, which we do in partnership with Piper Veterinary here in the city of Middletown. And we also took a look at the Sindaver, our new high-tech teaching tool for vet tech students at the college. And with me today is Dr. Chris Gargamelli, the program coordinator for veterinary technology. And it's time for our, our ever popular Ask the Veterinarian segment, Chris. And this is something we've done a few times on Middlesex Moments, right? It is, and I love it every time we do it. Again, yeah. great questions in. Yeah, and it's not meant to be stump the veterinarian. It's really ask the veterinarian, right? So for uh, this time on Middlesex Moments, some of our Middlesex Community College students have recorded questions for you to answer. So let's hear our first question. What is the safest and most effective way to protect my dog from ticks and fleas? So that's a great question. In modern veterinary medicine, we really have three categories of products. We have the spot-ons, which are a small drop that go between the shoulder blades. We have collars, and then we have oral products. 
So it's really difficult to give a blanket statement as to which one is the best because it really depends on the animal and the family in which they live. So for example, in a household with small children where we don't want them putting their hands on the product and then maybe putting their hand in their mouth, we recommend the oral products. And then in you know, dogs that are in really kind of wooded environment that may be out you know, in the woods hiking a lot or hunting, we like the spot-ons. They really provide great protection for that. And then also now they have collars that last three months at a time. So for people with really busy lifestyles, they can put the collar on and forget about it for three months. So we really do have a lot of great options. And the other thing, they are species specific. So the products that are designed for dogs are, are often unsafe for cats. So it's really important to work with your veterinarian to get the right product. But we do have a lot of options depending on the circumstance. Okay, and regardless of which product do you, that you use, is it always good to physically check your pet? To look for ticks? It is because you know, oftentimes some like the what we call the dog ticks, the bigger ones you will see, but unfortunately the deer ticks, which are the ones that do carry Lyme disease, are so small. They're like the top of a pin needle to see, so oftentimes they are missed because they are so small. Okay, great. Now here's our next question. Can dogs get migraines? If so, how would I know if my pet has a migraine? So that is a really tricky question because what happens, we first start actually on the human side. Having a migraine or having a headache is a symptomatic diagnosis, meaning that you have to tell your doctor you have a headache. There is actual no test for it. So it's theoretically possible for our veterinary patients to get a migraine. Their brains are very similar to that of humans. There would just never be a way to tell because we can't ask them. So while it is possible, nobody has ever proven that one way or the other. Okay, but you should be aware of your pet's behavior and notice any significant changes in how they've behaved. Exactly. So especially with neurological issues, you know, if there's concern about like a meningitis, like an infection of the brain or a brain tumor or a spinal cord injury, you're going to see behavioral or neurologic changes in your patient. But again, it may not necessarily be a headache, but those are all changes that warrant an immediate trip to the veterinarian. Okay, great. And now for our next question. Is there a test that can determine if your older dog is losing his or her hearing? Yes, there is. So there's a couple different ways. There's kind of the very basic screening. So if you go into your general practitioner veterinarian, they can basically see how your animal responds to sound. So what they'll do is they'll stand behind the patient, clap on one side or make a loud noise on one side and make sure that the patient turns their head one way or the other. So it's a great initial screening test, but it's not very sensitive because if you have hearing in one ear versus the other, you're probably still going to respond to the noise and it doesn't really look at a diminished level of hearing versus full hearing. Okay. So that's kind of the basic level. To expand on it, a lot of veterinary neurologists, so that's a very specialized area of veterinary medicine, have what's called a BEER test, B-A-E-R. And what it does is they actually put little electrodes on the brain, you know, so they just put it on your scalp. And what it does is it measures the electrical activity in the areas where sound is recorded. So they actually can do a substantive test to give you an actual reading on the level of hearing. So again, a very specialized test that a lot of owners don't pursue because you know, whereas a lot of humans, you know, hearing is very important. You need to, you know, hear what's going on, have conversations. If the veterinary patient can still hear commands and still hear their owners, it's often not as big of a concern. Okay, great. And now, our next question. Are there natural plants or natural things you can do to deter snakes from coming to your yard? So, the answer to that question are there are lots of products out there. There are ones that smell awful. There are ones that put electronic vibrations into the ground. There are herbs. There is a list. I could probably rattle off 20 different things. Mm -hmm. None of them work. None so work. it's funny, if you kind of look, we have online veterinary databases where veterinarians can post questions and other veterinarians can answer or specialists can answer, and the consensus across the board, and you know, it's hard to get consensus of like 100 veterinarians, the consensus across the board with no naysayers was there is nothing out there that consistently works well.
Wow. So it's a tough one because people don't like snakes into their yard mm -hmm. because, you know, they can disrupt gardens. They're just, you know, they scare a lot of people. And, you know, depending on what part of Connecticut you live in, there are some fairly large copperhead populations which are poisonous to both humans and animals. So, you know, they can be deadly. But again, unfortunately, there is not a good preventative out there that consistently works. Okay, good. Then I won't waste my money on any of them. That's do not do that. Okay. And now for our next question. Can a cat get sick or die from chewing or eating on houseplants? If so, is there a resource or website that lists houseplants that are dangerous to cats? That is a great question. And very timely, because one of the number one toxic plants that we're heading into for Easter are Easter lilies. So all variety of lilies are toxic, but in particular, the Easter li lilies that you get around the holidays are very toxic. And just eating the leaves can put a patient into kidney failure. So that's kind of the very timely example right now. But there's a list of over 400 plants that are toxic to cats. And what happens with that is some might be very minor GI upset and some can be deadly. So the ASPCA Animal Poison Control website has a great list that's searchable by species. You can search by dog, you can search by cat. You can also search about the common name of the plant versus the scientific, so it is a great resource. Okay. Well, speaking of chewing on things, I, do, I have a question for you. I'm uh, an owner of a small Shetland sheepdog who has bad teeth. So uh, how important is dental health to our, um, our animal friends? Dental health is incredibly important. So with dental health, it actually has effects to the rest of the body. You can get bacteria everywhere in the system. You can get heart disease all associated with dental disease. So kind of tying it back to the veterinary technology program, a lot of what our students do is that dental prophylaxis, that dental cleaning. And as patients age, some need it once a year, some need it twice a year. So dental and oral hygiene is incredibly important. You know, at home, you can brush, but a lot of patients don't let their owners brush their teeth. So, you know, having that regular cleaning at the veterinary office is a key component of overall health. Okay. So uh, I think the, the most important message is that if we are taking care of pets or animals that are part of our lives, whether you know, it's a horse that we take care of or farm animals, that their health is as important as our own health is to us. Exactly, and that's what we train our students for in the program, that in many cases with the dogs, the cats, the horses, they are family members, and even a lot of the guinea pigs are smaller pets. You know, a lot of people consider their pets part of the family, and our goal in veterinary medicine is to provide the same level of care that they would expect for any family member. Okay, and a big part of that is the work of a veterinary technician, and again, that's what we are training students here at Middlesex Community College to do, almost uh, the pet equivalent of a nurse. Exactly, and there's something called the Veterinary Nurse Initiative now to actually change that title so that people do realize that our veterinary technicians are very similar to the nurse that you would see in a doctor's office or hospital. Okay, and how can a student get more information about the Veterinary Technician Program here at Middlesex Community College? So going to the Middlesex Community College website, which is www.mxcc.edu, and then clicking on Admissions, and then selective admissions in our vet tech program is right there on the website. Okay, very good. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, Chris Gargamelli, the program coordinator of veterinary technology at Middlesex Community College for being with me today on Middlesex Moments. It's always a pleasure. I love doing this. Great. And we want to thank you for tuning in to Middlesex Moments. And as always, you're welcome to visit us here in person at our main campus in Middletown at 100 Training Hill Road. You can also visit us at our Meriden Center located at Platt High School at 220 Co. Avenue. And as always, visit us 24-7 online at mxcc.edu. So for the students, faculty, and staff at Middlesex Community College, I'm Steve Minkler, and we hope you join us again very soon for Middlesex Moments.